very well fed for minimal effort. And they were getting very strong and very peppy, and they got lots of rest because it wasn't as difficult finding food in the garbage dump, <laughs> despite the fact that you had to go through barbed wire and occasionally one of you was shot. Um, it just wasn't as tough as, um, as eating natural food, uh, as eating health food. And um, these baboons eventually, um, they, they started work, uh, living on their own, they started sleeping on their own, uh, and the, fe- the young females noticed that these baboons were doing very well, which made them very attractive. I mean, you're a lot more attractive when you've got an expensive sports car, and in baboons, if you're really well fed and you're hunked up, you're attractive. So young, restless, adolescent females who weren't doing that well in their own group started um, fiddling around with the outcast baboons, with these rebel baboons, and slowly but surely decided to move their sleeping headquarters and go from sleeping with the old conservatives to sleeping with these new rebels. And eventually some of the middle-aged females who were being rejected by the high and mighty males of the conservative troop started to move over to young baboons. And then the young baboons began to pick fights with the old conservative males. And it turned out that uh, folks fed on a diet of health food cannot contend with a bunch of guys who are eating garbage. (laughs) And uh, they beat the older males, they beat the conservative males time after time after time. And because of this intergroup turn, this intergroup tournament, um, the the meme of these baboons, their concept: let's go for garbage, let's go where the humans are, let's break into their kitchens, in their cottages, um, let's break into their crops. All of these were innovations of the young troop of baboons, and that innovation stuck because it formed the base of a superorganism. It formed the base of a new group, a new subculture. And baboons work by pitting subcultures against each other. Um, they're, very, they're very clever. And as you said, in, in this book, Global Brain, it says that each subculture is a, a different hypothesis in the group mind. It tests a different approach to life. So what baboons do, especially in larger groups than the ones that Shirley Strum studied, baboons will gather at night on sleeping cliffs of between, that contain between 200 and 700 baboons. Chimps never do this. Chimps stick together as one group, and that's it. And there are only 35 of them, and that's not that many. Um, But baboons do get together in groups of 200 to 700 at night. And guess what they do in the morning? They exchange information. How do they do it? They do it by competing and quarreling. That is, the male baboons will get together, That the the alpha males of each of these little subunits will get together, and they will argue over which direction to go that day. And they'll do it with body language, needless to say, they don't do it with with verbal language. Um, And then when they're finished, they'll all go off and and, uh, on their individual ways, following their own particular strategies with their own little group of six or seven. Then they'll come back at night with what they've learned, and the next morning they'll transmit that information that they've learned once again by quarreling. And some of the group membership will shift? Yeah, it's called creative bickering in the group, in the book. And there are many, many examples of it. In biology, in evolutionary biology, creative bickering is very important. It's, uh, it's akin to what's called, not lateral displacement, it's um, when, when your hand is developing in the womb, uh, lateral inhibition, that's what it's called. Mm-hmm. Um, a- evolution works by a combination of uh, attraction and repulsion. Attraction and repulsion show up at the very beginning of the Big Bang. At the very beginning, and we talked about rules that repeat themselves on level after level, fractally, well, this is going to sound silly, but it's not silly. Um, at the very beginning of the Big Bang, you've got the precipitation from nothing but a sheet of space and uh, of speed, that is space and time. It's expanding at an astonish, astonishing rate. You have suddenly, as if, the, uh, as if they were raindrops precipitating from a cloud, the precipitation of the first things from a nothing, the very first thing. And those first things are quarks. And those quarks instantly gather together in groups of three. Now, how do they do that? Well, quarks come complete with an etiquette book. They come complete with a little set of rules on who they should get together with and who they should avoid, attraction and repulsion. And they avoid those other quarks they should, and they gather with the other quarks that they should, and they get together in groups of three and stick together forever for the life of the universe. That's attraction or repulsion with rules at the very beginning of the cosmos. 
And attraction and repulsion work miracles when it comes to pitting one group against another. Because what happens is a group will set up its own way of doing things, it will set up its own look, it will set up its own style, um, it will set off things that differentiate it from other groups, and it will go through squabbles with other groups that keep it on its own path. But then it will share that information even if the sharing takes place through competition. So it's turtles all the way down, in other words. <laughs> it's what? It's turtles all the way down. Yeah, it's turtles all the way down. It's um, attraction and repulsion all the way down. So, so well, I, I won't even try to summarize the vast amount of Paleolithic and prehistoric and ancient and uh, on into the modern era. I mean, it's just an extraordinary amount of documentation of cultures and societies and um I couldn't even begin to do justice to all that's there. But what I wanted to do at this point is is bring things forward to the present day and ask you to just think about what has happened in the last 10 years. Um, because, you know, for a lot of people, the, the notion that, that we are becoming a collective mind feels like a new thing and it feels like a thing which is enabled by the advent of the internet and by the many new forms of high-speed communication and pervasive connectivity that have emerged in the last decade right um the point of your book is that no 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 this is how it's been from the very beginning of life and so you know you may see um the last 10 years as being not special really at all or maybe you do I mean, well maybe... they've been very special to me john because um you you know you heard me say this on the panel um you know that in 1988 i was hit with a really disastrous illness and i was i suddenly found after working two days a week in la and working five days a week in new york and and uh keeping a, a knapsack with the trs 101 behind my desk so that uh, I could get a call at four in the afternoon saying you've got to be out here uh, by 11 o'clock tonight. Michael Jackson's about to cancel his tour. You're the only one he'll listen to. And, um, and, and being fully prepared to go to Atlanta or to Houston or to L.A. or wherever it happened to be and troubleshooting the problem. All of a sudden, I was landed in bed. I was too weak to talk. And the Internet saved my life. So I became very aware. I mean, I computerized my office in 1983. I would have done it in 1976, but the computers were too expensive. By 1983, we had K-Pros, and we were on CPMs, and we had 15 of them in my office. Um, and uh, we went on the Internet. Uh, I, I was lusting after the Internet in the late 1970s when only university professors had access to it. And finally, in 1984, it was offered in, uh, in the music industry, which is where I did my science experiment, um, my science project. And um, so I got on the Internet in 1984, and the first thing that happened was the Internet was so sparsely populated though, in those days that people saw you. You were in this empty space with just a few other people. So <laughs> Peter Gabriel immediately spotted me. <laughs> And 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 sent me uh, an email welcoming me to this this unpopulated space. But in 1988, when I was tossed into bed for 15 years and deprived of all the forms of communication that I had known before, except my computer, when I finally moved two computers next to the bed, hooked them up to a uh, a, a keyboard, one keyboard, hooked them up to one monitor, got a switching device that came from China, which means China was always in, already inventing wonderful new things in 1990. Um, the Internet saved my life. I lived online. I, I lived online in the days when the Internet was dark. Dark because we didn't have much in the way of visuals. There was no World Wide Web. So do you think that the what feels like hyper-acceleration of data exchange, and human interconnectivity. That is something you experienced very early, something I experienced a bit later, but still relatively early. But now something that is being experienced very widely, not yet not yet universally by any means. There are billions of people still excluded, but it's, it's extremely widespread at this point. Do, you know, and, and in the last couple of